Hey, when life throws us a bad situation, we either respond or react. We react by fight, flight, or freeze. And we don't want to do that. So in order to become people who respond, there's four elements that we need to place in our lives. Last week, Lori gave us the first one, which is pause. Today, she's going to give us the second one. So let's take a look. Good morning, Westlight. Um, last week we talked about the practice of pause, and today we're talking about the practice of ponder. And to ponder is to think about something carefully and deeply before we act. And this whole sermon series is the idea of, of getting rid of our, our old pattern of reacting, which is fight, flight, and freeze, and creating a new pattern of, of responding. And so everyday fight is not like we're fighting everybody. But it's when we protest our difficult reality. It's when we're like complaining or we're critical and we just like can't believe that this is happening to us. That's how we fight in our everyday life. And, and it's, it's when we try to maybe be, perf be perfect or when we try to do things or achieve things or control things or anything that brings us comfort and feel like make us help us feel like we have some kind of control in our chaotic world. And so maybe when you're doing those things, you know, which are good things, those are all good things, but maybe ponder like as we're doing these things, um, we could ask ourselves and be curious about why we're doing these things. Maybe we're doing them in reaction to our difficult reality. Oh, looks like pause and ponder Marie Kondo style. Ha ha ha. So everyday fight looks like ignoring or minimizing or rationalizing, you know, telling ourselves, well, our situation, our difficult reality isn't as bad as Joe down the street. He has it way worse, so I can't complain. And we minimize and, and, and rationalize what we're going through. And that's our way of um, flight, where we kind of don't want to deal with it. And so we're running away from it and we're focusing our attention on something else. It might be shopping or drinking or going on social media. Like we're going to turn to something that's going to bring us comfort so we don't have to think or deal with the difficult reality that's come our way. And so as you know, not that those things are bad, but when we're doing those things, maybe we could ask ourselves like, Hey, am I doing this because, um, I'm reacting to a difficult reality. Hi, Lori. How's the pause and ponder going now? Good. Looks to me like you're pausing between bites to ponder how good it is. <laughs> so every day freeze is like not being able to do anything. It's those times when we just want to curl up in a ball and not deal with the world. And maybe we might isolate ourselves. We just take a time out from the world for a day or two, or maybe a week or a month or six months or nine months, like when we think of COVID. But it's, it is just kind of like making ourselves small, um, diminishing who we are and what we want and just giving into the difficult reality and letting it win. And so maybe in those times when you feel like, man, I just, I just want to like not do anything or I can't do anything. Like sometimes we need those times. Like we need that space, that time out from life. But if we're doing it for a prolonged period of time, maybe consistently, then we could ask ourselves, like, be curious about, am I, am I feeling this need to, to be alone and to isolate because I'm reacting to a difficult reality in my life. Hey, Lori, how's your pause and ponder going? It's fine. I want to recognize that some of us are really going through some painful, serious, difficult losses. And I recognize that. And I think that sometimes maybe responding to our pain by seeing a, uh, a pastor, a safe person like a, a spiritual director or a therapist can be one of the best gifts that we can give to ourselves, that there's no pain that's too small or too large for help. 
So we have an example of pause and ponder in scripture, and it's in the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was, um, he was an Israelite, but he uh, worked for the Persian king Artaxerxes. He was his cupbearer. He was very close to the king. And um, he, they didn't have social media back then. So his brother came to visit him and told him about the suffering of Israel and about the wall being broken and the gates being burned down. And Nehemiah's response is just crying. He was weeping for his people and he prayed urgently to God. And he was so upset. It was like someone close to him had passed away. And so he, you know, he goes to work the next day and even the king notices that he's depressed and he's like, Nehemiah, what's going on? And so Nehemiah explains how his heart is broken. And the king immediately, he's like, okay, here are your papers. I release you from exile. Go back to Jerusalem. And here, you know, here are some resources and to do whatever you need to do to, fi to fix the wall. So let's read Nehemiah 2, 11 through 16. So I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I got up during the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the animal I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate, past the dragon spring, and to the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the animal I was riding to continue. So I went out by the way of the valley by the night and inspected the wall. Then I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest that were there to do the work. And so Nehemiah, he paused and he pondered before he started doing the work. He could have just been, oh my gosh, I gotta fix this. This is the, my people, you know, the people are suffering. I gotta go in and fix it and make everybody happy again. And he could have just run in there and he probably would have experienced more opposition than he already did and have created more problems. But instead of reacting, he responds and he takes inventory of what the reality that needs to be, you know, the reality of where he finds himself. And it's not pretty. He goes um, at night to avoid the opposition and he inspects the wall. And I can just imagine like how devastating that is to see what was once so majestic and beautiful and honored and revered to see it broken and burned down. That it's not pretty and it's not easy and it's very difficult. And I love how he enters through the valley gate, right? And um, he goes past the dragon spring into the dung gate. And we can imagine what the dung gate is, is where um, they would take the refuse and dump it out there which we were like, okay, that's important. It's an important part of human nature and what we do. But for the, um, for the Israel's cleansing um, rituals, that was very important, as well as the natural importance of it. And then he goes around to um, the, uh, the fountain gate and the king's pool, and that's where there was a tunnel where water emerged from the ground. And, and so water sources were very important. And I love how he talks about the detail of how, well, this is where I couldn't take my animal. And, and they think that, you know, he had to go by foot because of how hard the terrain was. And so Nehemiah, he just doesn't go to the other side where it would have been easier or maybe there was less damage, but he goes to, to where it's hardest to look at. And he looks at the most important things. He's carefully pondering the difficult reality of what he has to face. I love what Richard Rohr wrote about facing our fears. He said, to live our lives based on the principles of a love ethic, showing care, respect, knowledge, integrity, and the will to cooperate, we have to be courageous. Learning how to face our fears is one way we embrace love. Our fear may not go away, but it will not stand in the way. And I just have to say, it's impossible to grow in our capacity to love if we don't face our difficult realities. But God is inviting us to be courageous. 
He's inviting us to let go of, of reacting by our old pattern of, of fight, flight, and freeze. And he's inviting us to create a new pattern of responding with the process and the practices of, of pause and ponder and partner and pursue. Last week I asked you to pause and, and to ask yourself like, okay, everything would be okay if, and so whatever you filled the blank in, imagine yourself bringing that to the table. This is what, everything would be okay if. And then now to ponder means to whatever you brought to the table, maybe it's COVID-19, be curious about it. Notice what, what, how it's affected your life. Notice ways you know, that you didn't really think about, but you can rejoice and praise God and be grateful to God and, and, and what gifts He's brought in the midst of our difficult reality. But maybe as you imagine COVID-19 on the table, you, you see kind of the, the difficult, the pain that you need to reflect on and maybe to dig deeper in and to ask more questions. You know, ask yourself one, where do we need to rejoice and where do we need to reflect? Notice how you're feeling and, and then ask yourself three, like have, have we felt these feelings before? So practicing pause and ponder is, is not easy. And to be honest, it could take days or weeks um, that whatever we bring to the table and to think deeply on it, it does take time and it's uncomfortable and it's painful. And, and we have to get more comfortable with the discomfort. It's hard and it takes courage. But if we can incorporate some kind of these practices into our routine and and maybe you're very disciplined and you could you could schedule it in your calendar and be like okay every night before I go to bed I'm gonna take time to pause and ponder and think about the difficult realities that I face during the day and and where where did I go to my old pattern you know why was I stuck on um, reddit for two hours or maybe you could rejoice and be like wow I felt myself wanting to um, clean and organized, but I stopped and thought, okay, well, what, what is this? What's driving this? But for me, I am so unstructured and so impulsive that I need to set up structure outside of myself to do this. And so I have like weekly and monthly calls that keep me accountable and, and create the structure I need. So I do take time to pause and ponder. So whatever like works for you, so in a moment, Kat and Juliet are going to lead us in, in the song, New Wine. And New Wine talks about the pressing and the crushing and how I love the line. Um, so I yield to you and to your careful hand. You see, God's inviting us to, to let go of our old patterns that are destructive of fight, flight, and freeze that wreak havoc on our lives and on our relationships and inviting us to, to take on this new pattern of, of responding, no longer reacting, but responding, which includes pause and ponder. And we'll learn in the next two weeks about partner and pursue, but it's in the responding where we face the difficult realities and the fears that come with it, that we grow in our capacity to receive God's love and in our capacity to love God, others, and even ourselves in a much more deeper and richer way. And that's what we call at Westlight Experiencing Heaven Together.